Um, I'd like to welcome Charlie onto the stage now. Thank you. Oops. Down. Oh, it's different up here. Can you hear me? <laughs> All right, hi, I'm Charlie. I'm the creative director at um, Helen Bales. I just want to start by saying thank you to Sue. Uh, thank you to Ken, uh, thank you to Fiona for all they do to put um, Sophie on and bringing us all together for this. Ken's nicked my opening lines, when I get straight into it. Once again, everything I thought I thought of, he thought of it first. So I'll just get straight down to it. Once again, the biggest challenge that this particular sector is facing is recruitment of new donors. You know, we've got traditional channels are saturated, they're in decline, we've got response rates going down, we've got um, acquisition costs going right up, you know. Um, so it's left us incredibly vulnerable um, in terms of we now have 80 to 90 percent of all of our new recruits coming from one channel alone, which is um, this, you know, the, the phenomenal amount of money that's raised by face-to-face -face and door-to-door. -door. Now we've only got to look back, what, 20 years or so to look at what happened to DM, look at what happened to um, press ads to realize that we're very, very vulnerable being so reliant on one particular sector. You know, there's warning signs that are already there, you know, despite the phenomenal, phenomenal good works that are done uh, with the money that's raised. It's not a particularly popular channel. There was a recent survey that showed that around two-thirds of people um, said they would actively avoid a fundraiser approaching them in this way. But even if things were to stay level, you know, for a little bit longer, you still got to look at the acquisition costs. Anyone who's ever done this, and I don't know if you lot have ever been out there and, and knocked on doors yourself or stood in the street and tried to persuade someone of your cause, but any one of them will be able to tell you that you can spend all day trying to persuade people, trying to speak to people, and get through to very few of them, speak to very few of them. So your acquisition costs are right up. And the saddest of all, that half the people that do end up joining us leave us just as quickly. So if there's anything that we can do that's going to reduce saturation, that's going to um, bring down the cost of acquisition and that's going to improve donor loyalty has got to be a good thing. Now, this particular idea that I want to talk about for a bit is not so much one that I wish I'd thought of, though I wish I did, but I actually thought I had. My career started, I was, what, 16 years old when I first had my first job and it was double glazing, you know, not that glamorous, but that's what I did to begin with. I moved from there and I progressed um, before joining the, you know, this sector uh, to MasterCard. But both them organizations used exactly the same proven two-stage method of using, hopefully this works, of using the, um, no, is it going to, yeah, of, you, of using the telephone, I've skipped my first line, sorry. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to forget this because it's not work. They used the telephone um, to drive pre-qualified appointments, okay? And they've had, uh, now if they can do that, in the commercial world, and they can persuade um, potential customers to invest in goods and services, why can't we apply a kind of Robin Hood principle in our sector and persuade potential donors to invest in their you know, vision and their values? Okay? Well, that's exactly what UNICEF India have done, using uh, a method that they call telefacing, and they've had incredible, incredible responses. 90% of all of the appointments um, that were made through telefacing ended up converting to um, become uh, donors. You know? What's more staggering for me is over a three-year period, 70% of the cash and 90% of the regular giving file stayed loyal. Now, you've really got, in such a risk-averse sector, you've really got to admire UNICEF for being prepared to test something like that, although it's so commercially proven, being prepared to test it over on this side and it's gone on to actually become one of the major channels that NGOs are using out there. Now, if, you know, if they can make it work in India, where you've got far stronger taboos around things like intrusion, where there's far more uh, organizational mistrust and suspicion, why can't we make it work over here? The only real argument I've ever heard against it is cost of acquisition, but I'm not really sure that I buy that argument. If you think about the time, money, and resource we're currently spending, if we were to take a fraction of that that we're losing anyway, we could easily cover the cost of some cheap, simple phone calls. Plus, if we're already raising, with all the inherent challenges this particular channel is facing, we're already raising a staggering 130 million each year, how much more are we gonna raise if the doors that we knock on we know are going to be answered, and the donors that we get are going to stay loyal to us. So 
you might want to ask yourself why I'm coming from a telephone agency and advocating using another channel. You know, why would I not just say, let's get, you know, why can't we do this all on the telephone? Why can't we do a, a, a nice two-stage campaign? For me, oh, the truth of it is, we've got to work together better. We've got to work together better. Our, our donors aren't thinking in terms of channels. They're not thinking in terms of silos. They're not thinking in terms of agencies. We need to integrate what we're doing if we're going to communicate with them in a way that makes sense to them. Moreover, I honestly believe that telefacing is a fantastic hybrid of two channels. Telephone's a fantastic, cheap, easy way to communicate en masse. But when you put it together with the other channel, suddenly all the pressure of that call is off. You know, with no pressure to get a deal straight or a, a, you know, a confirmation straight away, all you need is a simple, quick, focused engagement piece that at the first stage get them to agree to the principle. With the principle pre-sold, it means you don't, you're at stage two, your best reps are knocking on doors that they know are going to be answered by people who already share an affinity to your cause. And once we've done that, we can start to look at stemming some of the causes of attrition. We can stop some of the gimmicks that we're using in the moment that catch people's eyes, but they've never really caught people's hearts. And we can do what Alan was talking about, we can do what Ruben was talking about, and we can start to communicate these people. You imagine the possibilities we've got now to build real relationships, build actual journeys together, and what that's going to do in terms of lifetime value. So who knows how it's going to work over here, but given it's got such a proven commercial track record, and given it's had such a phenomenal impact and a much tougher climate, Surely we've got to be testing this thing, you know. So stay tuned to Sophie because P&B are going to be testing this later in the year, and we'll let you know how it went on. I wish I'd thought of it first, is all. Okay. So that's it from me. Just to let you know, we are sponsoring the drinks afterwards. So if anyone wants to um, come and have a natter with me or any one of the other speakers, it'd be lovely to come and hear what you thought you'd heard of first. Thank you. <laughs>